Well, good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, turn in them with me to Psalm chapter 33. What a living hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that lyric in that song, that, that moment that his body began to breathe. Can you imagine being in the tomb that morning at the first gasp of air that the Lord Jesus Christ took, conquering the grave? Uh, it's, it's a glorious thing. I was, I was blessed to be part of a funeral even yesterday and reminded again and again of the hope that we have is resurrection from the dead. And it's going to be ours for those who have faith in Christ to live forever with him. What a glorious thought that that is. So we're going to be in Psalm 33 this morning, continuing our series through the book of Psalms. And this Tuesday is our country's birthday. I did the math, and I think it's right, 247 years old this Tuesday. It's a country that's seen a lot of change in that time, but one thing has remained the same, and that is the bedrock of who we are as a people of freedom. But that freedom, as you know, does not come cheap. It comes down to us on a river of blood by those who paid with their lives to secure these freedoms. So I just want to take a moment this morning and thank and honor those who have served, who have put on the uniform. If you've been in the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, or you are part of the newly formed Space Force, <laughs> rise so that we may honor you. Thank you very much for, for your service, and we're thankful for all those who stand on that line today. Uh, I come from a history, a family history of military service. My grandfather, Raleigh Arnold, served in World War II in the South Pacific, and I'd always known that he was awarded the, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart, but I never actually saw the citation. So this week, I actually looked it up. You can go on the federal database and, and find what the citations are for. So if you will indulge me, I'm going to read my grandfather's Silver Star citation. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress July 9, 1918, takes pleasure in presenting the Silver Star to Private First Class Raleigh Arnold, United States Army, for gallantry in action while serving with the 148th Infantry Regiment. 37th Infantry Division in action against the enemy at Manila, Luzon, Philippine Islands on 9 February 1945, when a member of his company was wounded and left laying in an open field. Private Arnold crawled forward under enemy fire, removed the casualties' equipment, and administered first aid. Heavy hostile fire prevented the use of a litter, so Private Arnold procured a piece of metal roofing, placed his comrade on it, and dragged him to safety through a lane covered by machine gun and mortar fire. His gallant actions and dedicated devotion to duty, without regard for his own life, were in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Army. That, that moved me to tears this week when I read that. My grandfather died in 1963, and I never had the opportunity to meet him, but I will forever tell my son that he rose blood courses in his veins. Uh, my father served in the Navy from 68 to 72. I'll tell you my story in a couple weeks. I'm going to talk about testimonies. And uh, I thought I was on the path to be a Marine Corps infantry officer for, for my life. God has a way of laughing in the face of our plans and changing things. Uh, but I'm very grateful for not just the path that God put me on, but for the duty of service that, that's in my family. Even I found out, I was doing one of those uh, heritage things once and found out that I've got a relative who was a captain in the Revolutionary War on our side. Not Benedict Arnold. Hey, oh. <laughs> easy, easy. I better be very clear about this. Not that one. Different Arnolds. <laughs> I'm sure of it. So, so why do I begin even by telling you this, this uh, background in my family this, this morning? Two reasons. The first, just quite honest, is to give you my patriotic bona fides this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about how God intersects with nations today, and I want you to know I am a patriot. I love this country. I'm committed to the cause that America has been involved in. Second, I believe that our constitutional democracy is the greatest government ever devised by man. Uh, people think this is a Winston Churchill original. I think a lot of his originals were borrowed. <laughs> That's what makes it seem original. But he once said that democracy is the worst form of government. 
except every other kind. I believe that's right. I believe we have one of the best opportunities in this country, both in freedom and in the democracy that's been afforded us. So I'm grateful to celebrate with you all this week our 247th anniversary as a country. Well, one of the reasons why I love our country, too, is religious freedom. We talk about this a lot. And the framers of the Constitution thought it was so important that they made it the first of the enumerated rights in the First Amendment to the Constitution, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Isn't that wonderful that the first right protected by the framers of the Constitution was the freedom of religion? And so I'm thankful to be able to join with you today. As was mentioned earlier, many people cannot meet today. They are in fear of persecution wherever they're at around the world, and we don't have that challenge this morning. So grateful for the legacy of this nation that we have. So what I want to do this morning from Psalm chapter 33 is talk with you a bit on this kind of question is, how does God interact with nation states today? A little bit of political theology, if you will. How does the Bible speak about our allegiance, God's allegiance to nations, our allegiance to nations, the relationship between us as believers in Christ and nations? Uh, There's an Old Testament, there's a New Testament, we're going to talk about that. How does God deal differently even with nations during those time periods? And I figured Psalm 33 would be the perfect place for us to look this morning as we continue this series. And yes, focusing on the verse that Jonathan even read right before prayer this morning, verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, that we might be both grateful for our country, but also lift our eyes higher to our kingdom. With that in mind, I want to set that verse in the context of verses 12, sorry, 10 through 22. If you have your Bibles, look with me. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive In famine, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. So my big idea for this morning from this text is this. Love your country. Love your kingdom more. There's not an either-or thing here. We, we can love our country and we can love the kingdom, but as Christians, we must love the heavenly kingdom more than this worldly kingdom. We, we must love the heavenly otherworldly kingdom more than this temporal earthly kingdom. The, the danger there is if we invert these things. And if we invert these things, it leads us to idolatry. When we place anything as a greater love than God, King Jesus, and His kingdom... We have become idolaters. And I fear that many Christians, it's difficult to discern where their true allegiance lies. They profess with their lips that the kingdom of Christ matters most, but the way they live, the things they post, the issues that cause them the greatest distress are more about earthly allegiances. So we must actually love both, I would say. We must love our country, we must love the kingdom, but if we love our country only, then we're disobeying the first great commandment of loving God most. And if we love the kingdom only, I think we disobey the second great command to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're going to see why that is, I think, this morning. So a little bit of hodgepodge, if you will, of of thinking through some principles that will help us formulate a good approach, biblical approach, 
on how we should think about church-state kind of issues. I think many churches talk about these things too much. I think some churches talk about them too little. And I want to strike a great balance here at First Baptist Paducah to talk about these things because they matter. They matter to us in our lives. They matter to God and His Word. But to put them in their proper perspective and light. All right, so this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to frame it basically around two questions. First, how do we think through God's relationship to nations? And second, how do we live faithfully as citizens of our country and as citizens of the kingdom? It's going to come down to you in three principles that I think the Bible teaches us on this question, and then three applications that is the how now shall we live kind of piece. So here we go. What is the relationship between God and nations today? I'm going to build an, an argument here for how I think Scripture unpacks this. It's going to be brief, but I think it's important. And that is that God has dealt differently across the testaments of how he deals with nation states. So we have an Old Testament, we have a New Testament. The way that God intersected with his people in the Old Testament, I would argue, is different than he intersected with people in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God had a people. God had a nation. That nation was Israel, and he picked them out, and he set his love upon them, and he gave them his covenants, and they were his people to be a light to the nations that they might see what it's like for a people to know God. In Exodus 19, 5 and 6, Moses writes, although the whole earth is mine, speaking of the Lord there, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God is even professing at that point, all the earth is mine. God, God owns all of it. There, there's no regime in the world over which the Lord Jesus Christ does not have authority. But in the Old Testament, God set his affection on a particular group of people called Israel. And God promised that he would send his Messiah through this line, through the Davidic line. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we get that important passage in your Bible of what we call the Davidic covenant. God was making a promise with his people that one day, through the line of David, the Messiah would come. In 2 Samuel 7, 24, we read, And you establish for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. Salvation came to Israel and was going to come through Israel. And what's so amazing about that, what I, what I love about that, the reason why God tells us he did that is he wanted to take some small, puny, little, insignificant country that could never rise up and say, look at how great we are. Aren't we amazing? God said, I, I don't want that. I don't want somebody who can boast about those things. I want to take a people who could not be a people unless I was their God. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 7, 7 through 8. It was not because you were more in number than any of the other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. If you remember in your Old Testament, as the people of God are enslaved for 450 years in Egypt, everyone on the earth would have said, Egypt is the predominant power. God, the gods must be with Egypt, because look at how strong they are. But God said, my people are the enslaved people. I'm going to pull them out through ten plagues, through parting waters, bringing them through safely, conquering a land out in front of them, so that all peoples on the earth will not say, what a great leader Moses is. Look at how great Joshua is so that all the earth would say, look at how great God is. And then the whole idea that the Messiah would come through Israel. In Isaiah 42, 6, that it would be a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, 6, salvation to the ends of the earth. So in the Old Testament, it was God dealing with the nation of Israel, but the promise for the New Testament is that he'd be the God for the nations. The Apostle Paul actually uses an illustration in Romans chapter 11. Uh, if, if you ask me what is the hardest chapter in the entire Bible, I think it's Romans chapter 11. And in Romans chapter 11, Paul uses this illustration. He says, God had his people, and they were Israel, and they were kind of like an olive shoot, but they got arrogant, and they didn't believe. And you see even through the Old Testament, through exile and return, God would at times be putting his people out so that he could teach a lesson. And he's done that in the New Testament period where he said, Israel's not believing, so I'm going to cut them off. And I'm going to graft in 
the Gentiles. I'm going to bring in the nations. And it's going to provoke Israel to jealousy because I'm their God. And then eventually God's going to restore Israel and bring them back into that straight line. But we are in the New Testament age. In the New Testament age, it's God's love and care for the nations. That there might be a massive ingathering of the nations. That's why I think we need to be very careful. When we read the Old Testament and we see promises specifically made to Israel as the covenant people of God and pull them out and apply them to nation states today, whether that be America, Great Britain, France, wherever that is, if we take those out, we're doing a misread, I think, of Scripture. So one of these that, that happens often, Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. If we were going to apply that today, I think the best way to do it would be to say, who are the people of God today? It's not a nation state. Who is it? It's the church. Folks, if the church will humble itself, will pray, will seek the face of the Lord, then he will hear from heaven and heal the church and will see his righteousness go out through the nations. Now, I'll say this in a minute, but there's a principle at work. If everyone in America bowed their knee to King Jesus and professed him as Lord and sought to follow his ways, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be a a nation that God would bless? I think so. So we need to be careful with texts from the Old Testament, applying them to Israel as God's covenant people and applying them to countries, I think, today because his goal is for the nation. So the second principle is God's mission is for the nation. So principle two, I think follows principle one, God's heartbeat in the new covenant, in the New Testament era, is for salvation for everyone. So you remember right before Jesus leaves, he's going to be taken back up on a cloud, up to heaven, in the ascension, and he's got his disciples gathered there, and he gives them what we call the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, right? Panta ta ethne. Make disciples of everyone everywhere. What was true for Israel is now going to explode forth from Israel. In fact, you realize we talk about sending missionaries to foreign mission fields, and that's a great thing. America is a foreign mission field. We are not in the land of Israel where this all began. From that time, God's truth, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, has gone out to the world because that's his heartbeat. All nations, all people groups, in Revelation we read that at the throne of God, every tribe, tongue, and nation will be there, which means around the throne, I think we'll hear Spanish and Swahili and French and Farsi and Afrikaans and Arabic and Chinese and Creole and even English singing the praises of the Lamb that was slain for people everywhere. Do you long for that day? Are you excited about that time to watch the mission of God fully restoring a people? What a day that will be. What a day that will be. And that's why one of the things I love about First Baptist, when I came here and we were talking about me coming, to hear your heart for foreign missions, to hear the partnerships we have both here and around the world to take the good news of Jesus to people who have not heard it because God's mission is for the nation. Salvation is for all. From Paducah to Israel, from England to Afghanistan, God is gathering a people, and that's exciting. And let me even just mention, they are predicting that by about 2050, for the first time in the history of Christianity, there will be more Christians living in the southern and eastern hemispheres of the world than the northern and western hemispheres of the world. I think we're right to say, why are things happening in our country? Why are things happening in the Western world? Why are people turning their back on God? I think those are good questions, and we're here, and we should be confronting those things. But don't think that God has stopped his mission. God is still moving, and he's moving greatly among the nations. And people are coming in in droves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing. Principle number three. God blesses Christianized nations. So you may have been wondering, is he ever going to get to that point? Because <laughs> we see this, this kind of verse, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I think it's important to kind of put that in, in that context. W- wouldn't a thoroughly Christian nation be wonderful? 
I mean, it would be the ideal nation. One under subjection to the lordship of Christ. One in whose laws conform to the law of Christ. One in whose heart beats with the love of Christ. That's where I want to live. Doesn't that sound like a great place to live? Man, I hope he'll do it here. Many people want the good old days, right? We, we want to return to a former time where things seem better. And we hear that all the time in our nation, where things seem better. Uh, this is interesting. Martin Marty, who was a preeminent scholar at, uh, of American Christianity at the University of Chicago, gives an important statistic on church participation in the earlier times of history. Now, if this was not a sermon and we were doing call and response, I would ask you what you think was church participation in the time of the Revolutionary War. Around 1776, what percentage of people in America were church attending, church participating people? 17%. 17%. The, it grew from 17 to 34% between 1776 and 1850. So when we look today and we say, it's never been this bad before, it has been this bad before. And one of the things God did at that time is he sent awakenings and he sent revival. If we're going to see America become more of a Christianized nation, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take the gospel of God going forth and awakening the lost so that they can see their need for salvation. And I think it's actually going to begin with real revival. We think about revival as people coming to get saved. That's awakening. Revival is when God's people who have been in malaise, God's people who have not been putting him first, people who have been kind of straddling the fence, actually catch fire from heaven, from God, begin to walk according to his ways, love him with all their heart, love their neighbors, pray for their friends and family. That is when revival will come. So we can't just look back in fondness of some of these eras. Here we are in this day and age. What will we do in this day and age to see the goodness of God brought to Paducah, Kentucky in particular? This is where God's placed us. Friends, he has not placed other people here. He's placed us here for this time. And I think it's also important to say we would never want a country in which Christianity is compelled on people. Christianity is not about compelling people to believe. Back in the, actually December 25th of 800, Charlemagne was crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And that brought in a new age in European history. And he had an idea that he was going to force pagans and the word pagan actually meant country dweller. Christianity began in the cities and it went out, so the pagans were out in the country. He was going to go to those places and he was going to force people to get baptized or die. That's not a good plan. It's not like the five laws of salvation. Number five is like, do you want to die today? Let's go back to number one. That, that's not good evangelism. And he had a friend who was in his court, Alcuin of York, who said this, Faith is a free act of the will, not a forced act. We must appeal to the conscience, not compel it by violence. You can force people to be baptized, but you can't force them to believe. At the end of the day, we are here to preach and proclaim the gospel and pray that the Holy Spirit works in lives. And we're going to do it with all persuasion. We're going to do it with tears in our eyes. We're going to do it with bended knee to the Lord that he would move. But it's ultimately not something that can be compelled. And I'll remind you that we are First Baptist Church of Paducah. One of the things that has been a fundamental pillar of Baptists since the beginning is what we call soul liberty. People are, to, are free to believe whatever they want. We're not going to force people to do it, which is one of the reasons why I love being a Baptist, that we've never been on the persecuting side. Baptists have been persecuted throughout history, but they're not the ones persecuting because we're not going to force people to believe on pangs of death. So a Christianized nation would be wonderful. What a principle. If we could see the gospel go forward, if we could see Christianity taking root deeper and deeper, it would be a wonderful place to be. So let's pray for that. Well, let me ask now in the phraseology of Francis Schaeffer, how now shall we live? So three applications of how we should live in light of these principles. Application one, live as citizens of two kingdoms. Theologians throughout church history, amongst whom I would count Augustine and Martin Luther, impressed upon Christians that we have dual citizenship. 
We're citizens of an earthly realm. We're also citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And that's not a bad thing. God set it up that way. In that responsive reading we read today, a lot of that was from Romans chapter 13, where it reminds us that every government that's been instituted has been instituted by God. Let me remind you of Paul's words. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Do you realize government is God's good in this world? It's his restraining force in this world. It's his mechanism to bring good and to punish evil in this world. All of them. God establishes all of them. That means whether there's a Republican in office or a Democrat in office, God is the one establishing. God God is establishing these governments from good, godly governments to evil, godless regimes. And wouldn't you just know, when Paul wrote that, it was not this lovely time, everybody was getting along. This is the day, probably of Nero, when Paul's writing these words in Romans chapter 13. Nero's not a good guy. Nero, like, kicks his mom to death. Not, not good. He would take Christians for sport, and he'd wrap them and dip them in tar and light them on fire to illuminate his gardens at night for his guests. If there, was, if there was ever an emperor where you could see Paul saying, submit to most of your worldly authorities except for people like Nero. But he's telling people under persecution, under the threat of harm, that God has established this and you need to be in submission. That's a tall order. I'll be honest, I don't always love that. I wish that was not the case. And there are exceptions, aren't there? If the government ever said, stop preaching the gospel, no way. If they ever said, sin against God, not a chance. If they tell you to pay taxes, nope. (laughs) Just kidding, you're with me, good. (laughs) No, just because we don't like it doesn't mean we don't have to submit to it. But if there's ever a conflict with what God has revealed, what God has commanded, we obey him over any ruling authorities. But we have to be reminded that God has put these authorities in our lives for good. One key verse that sums it up, we read it in responsive reading, is when Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. He recognized there's two kingdoms. You're going to live in the kingdom of Caesar. You're going to pay taxes. You're going to be underneath his rule. But remember, you're ultimately God's and you belong to God's kingdom. And as citizens of this world, we need to remind ourselves that we're ultimately citizens of another world. And Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. So we are a kingdom first people. When you became a Christian, it wasn't just, I don't want to go to hell, heaven sounds good, I'll believe these things, say these things, get baptized, walk an aisle, come to church, read my Bible from time to time. Salvation is ultimately a change of allegiance. You went from a person who said, I am the king of my life, I will do whatever I want to do, and you saw the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is, and you said, I will submit to your lordship. I have a new ruler in my life. His name is the King Jesus, and I will follow where he says to go. I will do what he says to do. I will talk the way he wants me to talk. That is where my allegiance lies. Where is your allegiance today? Who are you living for today? You living for yourself? Are you living for the king? Are you living for the country primarily or for the kingdom? Some people, your your allegiance is murky. Not quite easy to tell where the true allegiance lies. Let me give you a few diagnostic questions. What gets your heart? Politics or praise? What gets your time? Devotion or debate? What gets your resources? Elections or eternal things? Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is 
in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Paul was going to be executed, he reminded them, I'm a Roman citizen, and you need to take me to appeal for Caesar. He took advantage of being a Roman citizen. Paul knew, I am a Roman citizen, but he ultimately knew, I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's where my true citizenship lays. So we're citizens of this nation, we're citizens of the kingdom. Paul and Jesus both made clear our primary citizenship. Friend, your primary citizenship is heaven, so live like it. Application number two, seek the welfare of your nation. Jeremiah 29, 7, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So the point is, wherever God has kind of placed you, seek the welfare of the city. Seek the welfare of the nation. He's put us in Paducah, in Kentucky, in the United States of America. Seek the welfare there. We are to be salt and light in this world. We're the ones who bring godliness to this world. I I love, I I was reminded of this actually just before, uh, earlier this morning. This is the Apostolic Fathers. These are the first writings that come after the New Testament. And one of them was written in about 160. It was uh, called the Epistle to Diognetus. I think it was written to the Emperor Hadrian. But here's what he said. For Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humanity by country, language, or custom. His point is we infiltrate everywhere. There's Christians everywhere. Every foreign country is their fatherland, and every fatherland is foreign to them. And then listen to this. In a word, what the soul is to the body, Christians are to the world. The soul is dispersed through all the members of the body, and Christians throughout the cities of the world. The soul dwells in the body, but it is not of the body. Likewise, Christians dwell in the world, but are not of the world. You remember, be in the world, be not of the world. I love that illustration of like the soul in the body. We are the soul of this world. Christians who say, we have the truth. Jesus is the truth. He's not a truth. He is the truth. We proclaim that this is the inerrant, infallible word of God. We believe that these are the true words. And so I don't think it's arrogant of Christians to say in this world, we know the truth. And when we seek the welfare and the good of our neighbors, we're seeking it under the provision of God. That's not popular today at all. But I love people too much to be bullied into not thinking that they need God's wisdom in their life. Let me give you a big one that just happened last year. I was celebrating immensely to hear the Dobbs v. Jackson case decided. My mother uh, was very um, busy in the pro-life movement. She worked at pregnancy crisis centers growing up. I remember going there as a kid and knowing what Roe v. Wade did in 1973 and the 60 plus million children killed in its wake. But to see the Supreme Court last year overturn that in Dobbs v. Jackson is a glorious thing. For 47, 48, 49 years, people prayed, prayed that God would change that, and God did. That's seeking the welfare of your city, of your nation, when you see these just laws come in and replace unjust laws. And now I would say to you, it's not the time for retreat. It's not the time to go into silence. It's the time to speak up and act out for the good of our neighbors. There's a book that came out a few years ago called The Benedict Option by Rod Dreher, where he said, it's kind of time to cloister off, to become monastic communities. Christians can kind of take care of themselves, get off the grid, and let society begin to crumble and decay. And at some point, we'll enter back in on our white steed. I think that is the wrong-headed approach. Right now is the time to engage to be active, to seek the good of our country. Application number three, pray for your country and its leaders. This better be the most uncontroversial thing I've said today. Can you pray for your country and its leaders? Can you do that? If you don't like anything I've said today, I'm commanding you under the authority of Scripture to be a people praying for your country and its leaders. Now let me ask you, it's honest question time. Do you complain more than you pray? Show of hands, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I got convicted of that even as I wrote it. And I thought, man, that, that sounds great. That's gonna be convicting. 
And the Holy Spirit was like, yes, it is, Brian. I know someone who needs that in their own life. It's easy to complain. It's harder to pray. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm praying that every time I complain about things in the government, that the Holy Spirit convicts me in that moment and it leads me to pray. I'm, I'm praying that for you too. That we would be a people marked by our prayers for those who are in leadership. First Timothy 2, 1 through 2. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Let the world, instead of complaining about Christians being hypocrites, complaining about Christians in a myriad of different ways, say, but I know this, they pray for those who are in leadership over them. We can pray for our leaders in our country. In the early church, there was a similar struggle. This is not new of how do we relate as citizens of this kingdom and as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Just consider the example of Babylon and Jerusalem. So in Revelation 17, we read the stunning picture of an angel with seven bulls, and he's pouring out the wrath of God on the nations and on peoples. And then in verse 5, we read, uh, on the forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. Great to have the kids in here today. And of earth's abominations. And I saw the women drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So when he's thinking about how bad it can be in this world, he's saying this is like Babylon. The people who exiled us and enslaved us back in 586 B.C., this is bad. And Peter also refers to Babylon when writing to the exiles of the church. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Babylon was a code word for Rome. You couldn't just write, Rome stinks, and think that life's going to go well for you back then. So what do you say? This is Babylon. Rome is Babylon. Now fast forward about four or five centuries, and there's a Christian scholar named Jerome, and he's translating the Bible into Latin. It would become what we know as the Vulgate. And he's in Bethlehem doing this, and he hears reports that Alaric has led the Visigoths into Rome and sacked the city in A.D. 410. Here's what he says. A terrible rumor has arrived from the west. Rome is besieged. The lives of the citizens have been redeemed by gold. They have made of Jerusalem a shed for an orchard keeper. Isn't that interesting? So the apostles called Rome Babylon, and now Jerome is calling Rome Jerusalem. I think there's been times where America has been more Babylon in times where America has been more Jerusalem. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know which way it's going to go in the future. I don't think we have any idea. God's made no promise that it will stand. He is the one in Psalm 33 who makes nations rise and make nations fall. There's no king who can be saved by his great army. It's up to the Lord. So let us be a praying people. So even though we may not know, I think these principles help us understand how the Bible puts this together of how God intersects with nation states today and applications that we can all live out as we seek to be faithful to God, all under this larger premise of that we can love our country, but we best love our kingdom more. Let's pray. God, I do thank you for the nation that you have placed us in. Uh, we We are grateful for the freedoms that we have, and we love this country, and we would love to see a great revival breakout in it. We would love to see your word go forth in power and in majesty so that people would bend the knee to King Jesus and see their ultimate allegiance as their heavenly kingdom. Lord, I pray for those this morning struggling with allegiance. Lord, that you would remind them again and again and again that King Jesus is worth it. We pray this in his name. Amen.